All right, everybody, welcome back. All right, we have Dr. Frank here today who's presenting an ECCM conference for us. So can you uh, figure out the case before he presents the answer? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Natan Frank. I'm one of the CGY3s. I'd like to thank uh, Taylor, uh, Derek, Dr. Kim, and Dr. D'Souza for all the help, uh, the countless edits, and all the help finding extra resources for this presentation. Um, so we're going to start off um, with our triage note. Um, it came in just before midnight, and the arrival complaint, which is always good to note, was I have chest pain. Um, the triage note itself wrote that it was a, a patient had a fever, pain, a swelling to their legs, and that they had a pressure ulcer. Sorry? Louder. Oh, they had a pressure ulcer on his buttocks, and as for his words, it was infected. Um, so on the initial assessment, um, the patient's airway was intact, they were breathing, and their circulation was only <coughs> in tachycardia, and they had normal mentation. Uh, so going to HPI, which came in uh, about three hours later, it's a 42-year-old man who noticed right thigh swelling for four days. He first noticed a small ulcer on his right thigh, um, he tried some home treatments with peroxide, alcohol, swabs, and frequent dressing changes. Um, but he arrived today because it was more swollen and red. Um, so then moving on to review of systems, uh, he noted to have hematuria, dysuria, he was nauseous, he had dry heaving, he was anorexic, had subjective fevers at home, and he was weak. Um, in terms of his negative review system, he denied any shortness of breath, diarrhea, or cough. And of note, the chest pain that was an initial arrival complaint or was never addressed. Um, so for past medical history, in 1994, he had a GSW to his T12 vertebral body, which left him paraplegic. Um, he had very excellent functional status. He was independent on all his ADLs. He was able to transfer on his own. Um, he didn't require any help. Um, he had no history of diabetes. His only medication was ibuprofen, PRN, and he had no allergies. For social history, he didn't smoke, he didn't use any IV drugs, and he occasionally smoked marijuana and drank alcohol. Uh, so, moving into the physical exam, on triage, his vital signs were significant for tachycardia at 119, <coughs> our respiration rate documented at 20, a BP of 99 over 76, he was orally afebrile and sat in well in room air. Uh, for his general exam, he was just laying in bed, and he was anxious. Um, the HGN exam was uh, unremarkable, it was just normal cephalic age, age traumatic. Um, his chest exam was clear to auscultation, he was tachycardic and there were no murmurs. Um, his abdomen was soft, non distended, uh, but they did notice some tenderness in the left pelvic and left and few superpubic regions. Um, for the skin exam, there was some erythema, swelling, and tenderness from the right medial thigh to the right groin with areas of deep induration and no superficial fluctuance. Uh, there were two dime-sized ulcers on the right posterior buttocks. They were stage two with no period of drainage, and there were multiple sub-centimeter lesions in the posterior thigh and buttocks uh, that seemed to be pretty old and chronic. Uh, the GU exam did show any scrotal rectal swelling, tenderness, or erythema. Uh, for his neurological exam, his cranial nerves were intact, his upper extremity strength was intact, and he had bilateral uh, contractures uh, and chronic motor and sensory deficits, consistent with his paraplegia. Uh, so for a preliminary problem list, we have a junior kind of shout out what some of the things that we're dealing with, some of the things that might be coming up so far. Um, yeah, so, so we have tachycardia and the thigh swelling information. And there's also other issues like the hematuria, the systemic, systemic symptoms as well. Um, so um, could I have another junior help us out with some initial things you want to start, get started on this patient? Fluids. Fluids, good. Rectal Yeah. All very good interventions. Uh, so this is about what we did. We got some access, we started a bolus, we got an EKG just for tachycardia, and we did some phlebotomy and drew a VVG. Um, and then we came up with a, our, our initial differential diagnosis. So number one on our list was just, is this some kind of cellulitis? Is there some kind of abscess on the leg? Is there something a little bit deeper going on? Is this myositis, pyomyositis? <coughs> is this, God forbid, neck bash or phone ears? Um, 
In addition, you know, is this a spontaneous hemorrhage? Is there some kind of bleeding going on in the thigh or in the uh, buttocks? Um, are we dealing with a uh, blood clot or DPT? And then more exotically, is this some kind of other like exotic skin rash, like purpural fulminans, which is a life-threatening uh, syndrome and intravascular coagulation and hemorrhagic skin infarction that occurs in usually in children, but it can occur in adults also, and it's usually in the setting of severe sepsis. Uh, another exotic one would be levomisil toxicity, and this is an anti-parasitic that is off our markets, but is used as a common cutting agent uh, for cocaine, and it resu results in this necrosis syndrome of the skin. Uh, so the EKG came back first, and it was just tachycardic or 117, but no other abnormalities. And then we got our blood gas. Could I have a junior help us just figure out what the uh, significant findings are? for some further tests we want to start ordering, maybe some consultants want to get on board, any imaging we want to do. There's CT, uh, lab work wise. CK. Yeah, CK is good. LDH. LDH. And inflammatory markers. Rectal temperature. Rectal temperature. Uh, we also, um, just, this is what we ended up getting for the patient. We got urine, just for the hematuria, the syria, uh, <coughs> basic labs, your cultures, a chest x-ray, a CT scan of the area that was, um, where we had skin changes, and we also ended up calling surgery as well. Um, so now going through our results. Uh, one more junior um, to help us interpret all our blood results that came back for the patient. Yeah. 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 This, um, the patient actually has normal renal function before, yeah. so there's some <coughs> elevated renal function. Uh, uh, pretty impressive pandemia, some leukocytosis. Usually um, <coughs> it's elevated, don't really know what to make of that. Um, and then the UA was also mm -hmm. positive. And the albumin was a bit low, and the CO2 was a tiny bit low as well. Uh, and moving on to our first imaging test that came back, we got a chest x-ray, which was clear. They did note a metallic form body in the T12 vertebral body, consistent with the GSW. And then uh, we got our CAT scan back, and these are some representative images of the CAT scan. So you can see there's a lot of asymmetry. And yeah, he's paraplegic. Is he like a continent? Is he self-cat or? Um, we actually tried to figure it out. We're not 100% sure, um, but. He either uses a condom catheter in the or self cast. Um, we couldn't figure it out from documentation and we weren't 100% sure. I believe he was able to urinate sometimes. So you can see from the CAT scan, there's a lot of asymmetry that just jumps out at you initially. And you see a lot of um, like, um, brightening of the image. Uh, and uh, you see involvement of multiple areas of soft tissue. So it's not just superficial. Um, moving up just a little bit farther in the CAT scan, you can see there's still involvement pretty high, a higher up on the pelvis scan. And then a side by side on the cross section, you can see there's a lot, of, these aren't exactly symmetrical cuts, but they're similar. You can see the ones, the right side is significantly more swollen. And then this is one more cross section, which just shows the pretty stark asymmetry we see in the CAT scan. Um, then our radiologist uh, gave us a read for our CAT scan. Uh, they read as an extensive inflammation. They felt there was concern for myositis. <laughs> they couldn't rule out pyomyositis. Um, they didn't see any focal abscess. And they saw a few foci of air within the soft tissues. And they noted that this is likely due to previous trauma or ulceration. And that the scan was most likely consistent with severe cellulitis. Um, and then they wrote, if clinically concerned for neck bash, uh, recommend MRI for further evaluation. Uh, the next thing we see in the chart is 
This is about four and a half hours after the patient arrival. The patient had, was reassessed by the team taking care of him, and they noted um, continued tachycardia, a little bit improved, a blood pressure that was a little bit lower, 81 over 50. Um, and then they noticed increased right groin swelling, redness of the tissue, and they also noted severe tenderness on exam despite poor sensation due to the patient's spinal injury. And so our update problem list, now we're kind of really honing on, on some kind of like infectious, septic process, secondary to soft tissue infection. Um, so then we called uh, a general surgery. They wrote their note um, about seven hours after the patient's arrival, and they thought this was most consistent with uh, severe cellulitis. They recommended admission to medicine for IV antibiotics. They were gonna follow the patient closely, and the attending wrote that they thought this was very unlikely in nephritis fasciitis. Um, so just to round out the e course, they end up getting uh, Motrin and Clindamycin about three hours into their stay, then additional ceftriaxone, a uh, small dose of morphine, our surgery consult, and they were finally dispositioned, dispositioned to the medicine floors um, just before shift change. Um, after this, the same initial ED provider wrote another update note, um, noting that heart rate was improving, but the systolic blood pressure was still 80. Um, they ordered an additional two liters of IV fluid, and that they had obtained a repeat lactate, which was still elevated, 3.6. And they noted the erythema on the previous exam was extending beyond the previous margins. Um, so they called surgery back to reevaluate the patient. Um, surgery noted the continued tachycardia, the blood pressure that was a tiny bit lower than before. They noted swelling now of the right scrotum. They recommended a right lower extremity duplex to rule out DVTs which is ordered but never done. Um, they recommended continuing the IV antibiotics, IV fluid, uh, frequent groin exams, and the uh, GU consult. Um, a little bit later on in the morning, the ED again called um, MICU just to evaluate the patient as well. Uh, they noted tachycardia that was somewhat improved, the blood pressure that was now a little bit better than um, kind of the middle of the night, but kind of closer to the triage blood pressure of 95 or 55. And they wrote that the exam and the imaging was, was not consistent with nephritis and fasciitis. They recommended continuing IV antibiotics, and they recommended giving an additional one liter of IV fluid. Um, so the rest of the inpatient course, at around noon, um, they end up getting uh, hypercillin tazobactam and vancomycin to increase the coverage from the clinda and the ceftriaxone. They got an additional three liters of IV fluid, so bringing the total fluid um, resuscitation to six liters. They got another small dose of morphine, and they finally um, left the EEG and stopped boarding there in mid-afternoon. And then the next thing that came in on the chart was a gener general <laughs> surgery acceptance there um, in the afternoon. And they noted a persistently elevated lactate, a worsening physical exam, and now they noted necrosis of the right groin, and they were concerned for neck, neck fash. And they immediately took the patient to the OR for the and it seems like they went relatively quickly because by 17, 19, like the operative cultures were being ordered. Um, so this is a really busy slide, but it kind of outlines the, how quickly everything <coughs> happens and kind of gives you a timeline of the whole process. So in bright green are all the update notes, um, when those went in. The blue bars are where the patient was dispositioned to. The red uh, circles are the uh, vital signs that are noted in the chart. The darker green uh, boxes are the antibiotics when they were given, and the blue <coughs> circles are the are the fluids <laughs> that were given and their volumes, and then the orange um, <coughs> bubbles are the lactates that were uh, drawn and seen on the patient. And you can see um, this all happened relatively quickly, within less than 24 hours. <coughs> the patient was getting a pretty aggressive fluid boluses, um, but you can still uh, see the lactate uh, remained elevated and kind of stayed lateral. And the, the vital signs, uh, the heart rate did improve, but the hypotension um, kind of uh, stayed similar and never really improved despite all the fluids that the patient got. Um, so as figured, um, this ended up being necrotizing fasciitis, and we're gonna go back to the case um, um, after a brief intermission where I'm gonna discuss neck, neck fasci and um, you know, um, the literature behind it as well. So for my discussion, I'm going to talk about the background of neck fash, um, the diagnosis, the role of the Lorenic score, pitfalls in making the diagnosis, and treatment modalities for it. So it's very rare. Um, it was hard to find good data on this, but most likely it was about 
0.4 to 100,000 people per year. And it's a group of life-threatening skin infections, the so skin, soft tissue, and muscle layers. And it progresses rapidly through fascial planes. And the, amount, the necrosis can be very dramatic. So it can occur at two to three centimeters an hour. So these findings, as we saw in our case, happen quickly. And time is very, very important. Um, it's a surgical diagnosis and can be diagnosed any other way. And in the OR, you're expected to see friability of the superficial fascia, a dishwasher grade exudate, and an absence of pus. Um, there's four types of neck fascia. Some literature has two, but most people divide up into four. The most common is type one. It's polymicrobial. It usually um, is made up of 4.4 organisms on average. They're usually anaerobic, anaerobic. Often they're gas producing. And most of these patients have some kind of predisposing illness. Like they have diabetes, they have renal failure, they're immunosuppressed, um, they're sick for some other reason. Uh, type 2 is a little bit scarier. It's monomicrobial. It's usually gram positives, usually group A strep, but MRSA is also implicated. And in this case, um, virulence factors from the group A strep play a big role in the pathogenesis and the severity of the illness, which we'll go into in, in a couple slides. And this can occur in any age and doesn't need underlying illness. So this is the kind of nectaric fasciitis that will affect like young, healthy, um, people with no comorbidities and no immunosuppression. Uh, type three is a little bit rare. It's also monomicrobial, but it's made up of some other organisms. Um, so for gram positives, clostridial species, for gram negatives, E. coli, Aeromonas, and Vibrio. Usually these people have, um, are immunocompromised, they have deep puncture wounds, they have crush injuries, or they have IV drug abuse. And then type four is very rare. It's a fungal form of neck fash. It occurs with candida or zygomites, and these patients are almost always immunocompromised as well. Uh, so I know this is a busy slide with a lot of stuff on it, but I think it illustrates a couple important points on uh, two different mechanisms through which group A strep can cause neck flash. Uh, the first one is this defined portal of entry mechanism. So as you can see in the first pane, you get some skin breach or um, mucosal injury, and then um, you get a local area of erythema and infection very superficially. And this starts to release exotoxins, and the group A strep at this point starts to release exotoxins, and the um, infection spreads into deeper uh, layers of the <coughs> skin, and into the um, deeper fascial planes, and into the muscle even. And you start to develop brule and ecchymosis, and severe systemic symptoms as the skin infection progresses into the deeper tissue layers. This occurs very quickly, like in 24 to 72 hours. So it's a rapid onset, and it occurs very quickly, and it's usually um, how we expect to see nectaritis fasciitis. Uh, the second type of, um, the second way that um, nectaritis fasciitis can occur in with group A strep is a little bit scarier. So this is the no defined portal of entry mechanism. And in these cases, you get some kind of deep in tissue injury. This could be some kind of like a muscle strain, a bruise, where the muscle itself is affected. And then, um, there's an inflammatory response deep in the muscle tissue when this happens. And for some reason, it's not completely understood. Uh, group A strep or other microbes are attracted to this area of injury, secondary to like all the inflammatory response. And then they start, as you can see in the third pain, they start releasing exotoxins. As they set up camp, they start causing a deep tissue infection. Um, and then at this point, because of all this toxin release, the patient will start feeling systemically ill. They'll start having nausea, vomiting, diarrhea and they'll have malaise, and they'll feel unwell. Um, the problem with this is that, as you can see in the third pane, even though there's necrosis and significant injury and infection occurring deep in the muscle tissue, there's no, there are no external skin findings at this point. You might see tenderness on exam, but you're not going to see erythema, you're not going to see pulley, you're not going to see ecchymosis. Instead, you're, the patient will have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, myalgias all very nonspecific symptoms, stuff that can be easily chalked up to gastroenteritis, food poisoning, or a viral syndrome. So often these cases are missed at this point, and the patients are sent home or are given an alternative diagnosis. Eventually, they will develop external skin findings as the infection starts to progress upward and um, externally. But at this point, the patient is very systemically ill, and the mortality rate is very high for these cases, like up to 70% or higher. Um, 
So this is a scary diagnosis, and um, it's important to think about when we should consider this. When should we be worried about our cases um, that look a little bit of equivocal? And we're taught the classic triad for neck fascia is local pain, swelling, and erythema, um, which is all pretty nonspecific. And fever and tachycardia are the most common vital signs, followed by hypertension and tachypnea. But how do we differentiate this from just really run-of-the-mill cellulitis, run-of-the-mill muscle bruise, or something else? Um, there's some red flags we can look for when we're, um, when we're working on patients for neck fascia. Um, one is pain to, to being disproportionate to the exam. So often these people have very severe pain. There's this uh, concept of crescendo pain, severe pain that's documented in the literature often. Um, these patients often respond, fail to respond to initial antibiotics, so they bounce back quickly. You see that whatever you're doing for them isn't really working and symptoms are getting worse. Um, another big red flag is if you see fines uh, beyond the area of external skin involvement. So say you have an area of erythema, but then you note on exam that there's tenderness past the margins of erythema. You see, uh, feel deep indurated tissue past the area of erythema or deep wooden tissue. That means there's something deeper on, deeper in the um, deeper fascial planes that's going on that's causing this infection. But you'll also often see systemic symptoms, sometimes it alter mental status. Um, you can also see crepitus, but you're not always gonna see this based on what the organism is and the extent of the severity of the illness. Uh, you can also see bullous lesions, uh, skin necrosis or ecchymosis as well, which are all concerning for the diagnosis. Um, so how do we make this diagnosis? Labs are generally not very helpful, sadly, and they're not very specific. In the literature, some common findings that are reported are elevated white blood cell count, elevated renal function, elevated pain. <coughs> There's a small study that showed that elevated CRP was pretty sensitive. Um, but it was a small, limited study. Uh, blood cultures end up only being positive in 25% of these cases, and surgical cult cultures are only positive in 80% of these cases. Um, so then we wonder, can MD calc save us? Um, and there's the wonderful Lorenic score, which is an MD calc, and it's the laboratory risk indicator for neck fash. It's based on C-reactive protein, white blood cell count, hemoglobin, sodium, creatinine, and glucose. And if you look at, you know, the constituents of the score, is this something that's really truly specific for net bash or the disease process? Or is this just a score indicating the patient is severely ill, a marker of severe illness? Um, so this study, this, the score was initially derived from a study uh, that was based uh, in two phases. It was all retrospective. They had development cohort of 89 cases and 325 controls in a validation cohort of 53 cases and 84 controls, so not that big. Um, it was all done retrospectively. They just had two different hospital sites, and they just pulled data from the two different hospital sites. The score had a cutoff of greater or equal to six, with a positive predictive value of 92% and negative predictive value of 96%. But even in the validation score, 10% um, of the patients um, who had necrotizing fasciitis had a score under six. So even here, it wasn't something that can truly rule in or rule out the diagnosis. Um, there were a bunch of studies that tried to validate the score. The biggest was Lau et al. They had 23, 233 cases. Again, this is a retrospective study, as were all the other studies that looked at the score. And they had a poor sensitivity of 59%, a specificity of 84%. Uh, two more studies also showed um, we're all pretty small with 28 and 80 cases. They had sensitivities of 80s. 80 and 77 percent, and a little bit more specificity is 67 percent. There's an interesting small retrospective study, Glass et al., which showed that, um, which reviewed 16 cases of neck bash, and 20, when 25 percent of them, so four out of those cases, had a very low score of zero to two. So even a very low score shouldn't rule out this diagnosis. Um, and interestingly, in this study, three out of those four people with a score of zero to two actually ended up dying from neck fasciitis. So it doesn't mean that they weren't sick, even if they had a low score. Um, there's another score, uh, another small study with 58 retrospectively reviewed cases, and they found that 21% of their cases had a score under six. And then there's one PEAT study with 20 cases that showed that their median score was pretty low at 3.5. There's a meta-analysis, which looks at the Lorenic score. This is a pretty uh, poor meta-analysis just because it's all uh, relying on retrospective data. 
And the Lao et al. study, the first study I mentioned, um, is by far the biggest study in this um, meta-analysis, so it probably significantly skews the data. They found that a learning score of 60, oh, uh, with a cutoff of six or higher, was sensitive if it's only 68% and only 85% specific. And if you bring the score up to eight as a cutoff, you lose a lot of sensitivity at 41%, and it was more specific at 95%. And you can just see from the chart on the right side, there's a huge amount of variability <laughs> in how the score performed in different studies, and they're all very, very small studies as well. Uh, so moving on to imaging, it's important to note that the imaging isn't always necessary, and if you're concerned enough about the patient for neck bash, you shouldn't delay treatment and, fi and getting your <coughs> surgery on board um, to get imaging. And it really should be reserved for cases where you're concerned for it, where you have equivocal findings. So um, plain radiographs, uh, the one finding you can look for on them are soft tissue gas, but it has very poor sensitivity and is somewhat specific, specific to the condition. Ultrasound, everyone's favorite modality. Um, you can look for hyperechoic foci and reverberation re 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 artifact and dirty shadowing, which would indicate gas in the uh, subcutaneous tissue. But again, we're not always going to see gas, depending on what type of neck bash we're dealing with. And then the other findings we can look for are cobblestoning and fluid in deep, deep fascial planes. But I would have a hard time differentiating what just simple cobblestoning in cellulitis would be and um, what neck bash would look like on ultrasound. Um, maybe um, if you're very skilled ultrasound, you can figure out what fascial plane you're really looking at and where the fluid collection is. But it, um, this, is, this is an ultrasound of neck bash and it looks somewhat similar to uh, what I would see in cellulitis as well. Uh, so CT is most commonly used. There's not much data on the utility of it and what we should be looking for, but there's one small study that showed that fascial involvement, like any kind of fascial involvement, was 100% sensitive, but they didn't report specificities, and um, that the absence of fascial enhancement um, was somewhat sensitive as well, but again, no specificity. Uh, gas itself had poor sensitivity and wasn't, um, it was a little bit more specific, and then if you combine fascial enhancement, fascial edema, or fascial gas, so any fascial finding at all, in another study it was pretty sensitive at 94%, uh, but not very specific at 76%. Uh, MRI has better accuracy according to the literature um, than CT, but it's rarely used as this is a, like a slow, time-consuming process. For someone who's critically ill, it might not be the best thing to send them to MRI. Um, the findings you should look for are thickening and hyperinflation hyperintensity of the intramuscular fascia. And it's a sensitive finding, but it's not very specific. Some additional testing that can be done is people have proposed, proposed percutaneous biopsies. Um, but it's been shown to be a poor substitute for actual surgical intervention and biopsy. And it shouldn't replace actual taking the OR. Okay. Um, surgery, in the sur surgical literature, there's also the finger test. Um, where you anesthetize the skin that's affected. You make a two centimeter incision into the skin down to the deep fascia, and then you just probe with your finger. This should be done by <laughs> surgery, obviously. Um, and look for the, the classic surgical findings, of dishwasher pus, a lack of bleeding, and a lack of tissue resistance. Um, but even though this, is, this does, we does find that this, this procedure has found its way into many texts, we haven't found any evidence that truly supports this. So we're not sure if this could really replace taking a patient to the operating room. Um, so just briefly, I just want to go some pitfalls and diagnosing these conditions and traps we often fall into. So often um, we don't see a fever in these cases. And as you saw in this patient, they never spiked the fever um, before they were diagnosed with the condition. Sometimes this is masked by NSAIDs. Um, some literature reports that there's a certain species of clostridium that was a really amount of fever response. And our meta-analysis showed that fever was uh, not very sensitive or not very specific for diagnosing the condition. Um, and then also this scary um, lack of cutaneous, man cutaneous manife manifestation that can occur in that bash. So as, uh, as we saw in the initial in one of the uh, pathophysiology slides, you can have cases in that bash where you don't have any external skin symptoms or skin findings until it's much too late. And the classic one of the classic things that we look for are these concerning hemorrhagic brulee, 
what their sensitivity is already for, so you shouldn't be waiting for those to make the diagnosis. Uh, another big thing is attributing pain to another cause. So this is a trap that often occurs when this diagnosis is missed. Um, where um, we think that this pain is caused by something else. Um, the uh, muscle strain, post-operative pain, uh, sometimes it's even chalked up to hemorrhoids. And this symptom of crescendo pain, this pain out of proportion of what we're seeing, is a big red flag for the diagnosis. And the last thing is, uh, we get a lot of non-specific imaging findings. So imaging isn't going to make this diagnosis. There's no 100% specific imaging finding. It's not a CT scan diagnosis and an operative diagnosis that needs to be made. We often only see fascial involvement as non-specific. We only see edema. And a lot of these patients can be postpartum or post-surgical. And this really complicates the imaging because you can see gas or other uh, post-operative changes that could be part of the normal healing process or it could be something scary. Um, and then the last thing is attributing systemic symptoms to another cause. So as we mentioned, um, in group A strep, um, their endotoxins, exotoxins, and release can cause a lot of systemic symptoms that can be very nonspecific. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea can all occur um, before you see dramatic skin findings, and you can easily miss this diagnosis because of that. Um, so moving on to treatment, the literature states that antibiotics are important, but they're little utility without surgery, and the proposed mechanism is that um, the tissue is just so necrotic and ischemic that you're limiting delivery to antibiotic, of antibiotics to the affected tissue. <coughs> but we couldn't find any literature that supports this. No, it supports, this supports that, that, that like not going to surgery is. Um, um, so the IDSA uh, guidelines are really helpful for the empiric antibiotics for this condition. They recommend very broad coverage, so vancomycin, or linazolid um, with hypercillin as a bactin or a carbopenem or ceftriaxone and flagyl. Um, if you know it's only group A strep, it should be hard to know just in the ED. A penicillin and clindamycin together is the standard of care as the clindamycin actually uh, suppresses this toxic production and cytokine production and reduces the inflammatory response. And then for that rare type 4 infection, the fungal infection, um, you want to include amphotericin or fluconazoles. Uh, so surgery is the mainstay for diagnosis and treatment. You do, you do a surgical debridement, <coughs> and mastectomy, and fasciotomy. Uh, the post-surgical gram stain is helpful because it helps determine you know, the causes of organisms and helps us guide treatment. And the gold standard for the diagnosis is the surgical exploration and analysis of the tissue um, by microbiology and pathology. Uh, the timing of the surgery is really important and it seems to be the key to determine the mortality and the outcome for these patients. There's one study that showed the 24-hour delay uh, increased the relative risk of mortality by 9.4, and really it was the only one modifiable risk factor in mortality when it came to the disease. Um, for these patients, they end up going back to surgery many times. So generally, they go to surgery, and then 24 hours, they go back to surgery for additional inspection and debridement, and then they go back every one to two days until there's no more necrotic tissue and no more signs of the necrotic fasciitis occurring. Um, and then just a couple of quick treatment pearls um, for um, things to watch out for this in this case. So the IV fluid requirements can be really high. So this is just like a severe case of sepsis, you're getting capillary leak, you're getting a uh, severe systemic response by the host. So aggressive fluids are often needed. Um, the literature states that you should be watching the hematocrit instead of the hemoglobin sometimes for when this patient should be, patient should be transfused as sometimes the hemoglo hemoglobin lags a little bit behind the hematocrit um, and these cases where you get a lot of hemolysis um, even without the IC. Um, there's evidence of um, group A strep also, toxins also causing cardiomyopathy in these cases but luckily this is reversible in 3 to 24 months. And then uh, the use of pressors should be done carefully just because you really want to try to maintain as much perfusion to the affected tissues as you can. As they're becoming necrotic, you're losing perfusion and you're losing more skin tissue. So if you're going to start pressors, I would keep the, the MAP target low and just use them judiciously. Um, so now back to our case. So uh, we have our operative report, which showed no purulence 
um, but they sell a lot of murky and ischemic tissue and this dishwater pus that we were expecting to see. Um, they divided the tissue to the these natural layers until they found viable tissues. Um, they found a bunch of blood vessels, but none of them were viable, and they were all plotted off in the creating severe necrosis. And the area that was excised was 16 by 7 by 1.5 centimeters. Uh, the urine culture grew up strep bovis on the patient. The blood culture didn't grow out anything. And as we mentioned, it's only positive in 25% of these cases. Uh, the culture from the thigh operatively grew up beta hemophilic group A streps and they didn't isolate any anaerobes. Um, the rest of the inpatient course, um, the patient went back to OR five times, which is, as we mentioned, pretty common for these cases. So they have to keep going back for operative um, deprivements. The patient was discharged home uh, after 17 days in the hospital with a wound bath and episodes until back then. They returned four days later with a fever. They got four days of antibiotics and were discharged. Four days after that, a second discharge, they came back with another fever. They got two weeks of IV antibiotics, and at that time there was concern for a possible gluteal abscess. Um, but luckily, they did start improved, and they were discharged on PO antibiotics, and they haven't followed up since then. Um, so, just in summary, this is a scary diagnosis, and we really need to maintain a high index of suspicion for it, as we can be fooled easily um, into thinking that something else is going on. And that, as we saw in the case, and as we saw in the literature, um, the symptoms and exam findings rapidly progress. Um, so you should frequently reassess your patient and look for like a worsening of symptoms and really that should uh, raise your red flags for this diagnosis. Um, and this can present very insidiously um, with non-specific symptoms and minimal skin findings. So just because if something doesn't add up, just dig a little bit deeper and think about what's going on. And the liver next score is pretty much useless for rolling in or rolling out this diagnosis. So. Um, don't rely on it, and um, the diagnosis needs to be made surgically, um, so no imaging findings are going to help you with the diagnosis truly, and if you're really concerned for the patient, they need to go to the operating room, which is sometimes difficult. And uh, these are my sources.
consider doing the MRI to think that that would sway the decision? No, we didn't, we didn't consider doing the MRI. I think it was, uh, yeah, it was Friday night. Uh, I thought we had enough evidence with the uh, CT. Dr. Cerebio, I'm, I'm not trying to call it enough, I'm sorry. The attending surgeon uh, saw the patient multiple times with me at the bedside. Uh, we didn't think another imaging test was going to change uh, the level of concern. It was interesting, he, I mean, we, document, yeah, we documented that the patient was in pain, but he, I spoke to uh, the attending surgeon later on and uh, thought that maybe the fact that he was a paraplegic with the, didn't kind of see that the pain was out of proportion, that was something that skewed him, he kind of said. Um, he wasn't making excuses, he just felt that that might have been a factor. I'm sure he's seen a lot of neck bash, I'm sure the surgeon's seen a lot more than we do. Um, so. And, and, you know, and I'll say, no, we did document that, you know, there was severe tenderness despite this paraphernalia. So it might have complicated it, but we, we saw it. Did the, did the CAT scan report say anything about vaginal nausea? That was one of the things Yeah, I mean, they, they pointed out. They said not likely, like that, right? Yeah, they wrote, yeah. they described it. They described yeah. vaginal nausea. So, I mean, it, 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 it seems like they did. This is what they wrote. The, but the myositis, so deep tissue, right? The Molly brings a good point. That's one of the indicators that it is fasciitis when the fascia is involved, but they didn't comment on it. Yeah. And well, they did say, they, they, did, right. they did that on the standard there, which like leaves you kind of open right there if you're concerned to get another imaging. But I agree that the MRI probably would have shown the same thing, but yeah. it's not the best of and, I mean, this thing that this you're trying to prove your point. I think you have that much information on an imaging study, that person should go to the OR. Yeah. Like, you're, not, you're, you're talking about taking a risk on life and limb on this person. And while we can't force anybody, we can't take them to the OR, but I think um, it's just, like, you see something like that, don't let the surgeons, and I'm, I'm sure, the fact that um, Dr. Willis fought that had to be in the bedside a couple of times, I'm sure he's pushing for it. And if the surgeon doesn't want to take the door, we can't do it. But sometimes, um, it, uh, push your muscle does make a difference, but not always. And I think that's an important lesson, is that you really got to push these patients. If you're thinking neck fat, that person should probably go to the OR. Because otherwise, they're just going to end up like this person. They're going to end up in the OR, just in a, a lot worse place. <coughs> Oh, after just a few hours. <coughs> it, wasn't in the, it wasn't in all the research that was done, but one of the things that kind of made us more concerned were the, like the other localized inflammatory symptoms, like he had hematuria and dysuria. That was one of the things that made us concerned that he has this soft tissue infection, but it's also causing, potentially the soft could be causing his bladder issues as well. So that was something that was concerning to us in the deep space. So I don't know if that, it doesn't seem like it was studied or comes out in the literature. So to go back to the issue, I think we really should like just the fact that I think that we just exceeded a certain amount of gas and air and that that's not necessarily important that that's like that's what the whole issue of this thing was this, even though you don't technically need to do it. But I no, it was there. And there's a surface like this little air that's like and that's not true at all. And can you involve the skin and the muscle without like bothering the fascia? Uh, I think they're between each other. So yeah, but so, <laughs> <laughs> so the skin is inflamed, the muscle is inflamed, but I don't know about the fascia. I mean, the myositis concern is, is enough for me to, to say, okay, yeah, I it's like, to go in there and just check it out. And it's not just purely the muscles involved, right? The skin exactly. is also involved. So, I would think, if you guys, if there's so, no suspicion. How can you say the muscle is involved, the skin is involved, but fascia is involved? Who needs to say like yeah. <laughs> How do you make them say, like, they were just having their best. Yeah. I mean, they do this, they probably their best. They thought, like, this could really be neck fat, but I'm just going to... Radiology hedging hurt this patient. Yeah, they had Because a lot of times surgeons will, will, will rely on radiology. We know, often from this great presentation, you can't rely on radiology and neck fat, but it's very hard to ignore um, an imaging study. Yeah. And the radiologist saying cellulitis. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Sorry. Now I, uh, we can go to select curriculums.
So the juniors are going to stay here for three clinical pearls lectures. Seniors, you can head over to the EM conference room in Kings County, and you'll be getting a career panel from some of your uh, fourth year colleagues. Take a. Take five minutes for break, ten minutes for break. Five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 